Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our esteemed speaker. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which includes complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker, Wagner Denuso, author, speaker, leadership coach, and advisor. We're excited to have Wagner with us for a keynote titled, Exploring Essential Skills for the New Workplace. Welcome Wagner and over to you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, let me know if the volume is okay, but I'm very excited to be here because the end of this year is a very special moment. I think all of us have been through so much in the adaptation that we had to apply to every event that happens every month almost. Um, it's been, uh, a manifestation of how much change has been happening in the workplace for a few years now, but now is also an expression of our own capabilities. And I know HR leaders have the capability to be adaptive, to be resilient. But one thing that I want to start with here is the idea, and I know you've been talking to other leaders about this, emotional well-being is a state you know, it's always temporary, it's not permanent, but we have to strive to get to a place where we feel emotionally stable, emotionally available to our loved ones. And I keep talking about this because actually this state of well-being comes out of your commitment to manage your energy. At the end of the day, it's our natural resource. Energy is something that we can control, we can manage, and we can generate. So I think it's very important to think about that. But at the end of the day, self-care is a service. Why do I say it's a service? It's a service to yourself, to your own emotional well-being, but it's also a service to others around us. To think about taking care of yourselves as a selfish activity, it's really something that you should try to shift because at the end of the day, you take care of yourself to take care of others. And others around you would like to see you healthy. So think about that. When you're taking care of yourself, you are providing a service to loved ones. I just want to say this because sometimes that's the last thing on our agenda. But let's talk about transforming how we learn. Because learning is everywhere. Learning is transforming into the connective tissue of organizations. In the current business context, as you can see here, these strategic priorities from purpose and goals, but all that comes wrapped into this volatile environment. So it's not that we have strategic priorities they are setting in stone. Once I was talking to a senior leader in this financial service organization that I work with, and he was saying, Wagner, people need to understand that our strategies are always dynamic. It has to be an iterative process of thinking ahead and course correcting when we need to. So think about strategic priorities as moments in which you set a direction, but they do shift because the world is shifting around us. Industry shifts, the cross industry players, you know, Walmart's doing healthcare, um, some other big organizations doing financial services. Actually, Walmart is doing financial services. Amazon is doing healthcare. So these cross industry players are really disrupting the environment as well. Competitive landscape with the AI uh, is needless to say, AI is going to be primarily at the top of every organization's priorities next year because that's how you create competitive advantage by creating innovative ways in which you deliver to your customers. Organizational readiness, um, that's a big one. We need to orchestrate ourselves to create the conditions for learning to happen. So when we think about learning and development, we have to think about, it's not about the end product 
that's going to be the most valuable. The most valuable piece is when you start by creating the conditions in which people have capacity, in which people have the availability, access to the learning that they need to move and grow. So workplace design, that's another one, hybrid versus collocated. That's an ongoing strategy for many companies, but we need to deal with that. Skills and talent, capabilities. If you ask me what's most important for organizations to focus on is organizational capabilities, because with that, they can start thinking about technology. They talk about the, the process they need to change, the ways of working, work design, something that people don't talk much about, but work design is shifting with AI and everything else. And when you look at the efficiencies that organizations achieved in 2023, it was all about simplification, eliminating of layers. So you're going to see the movement towards a much flatter organization where teams become the unit of value. So these cross-functional teams, these teams that come together for a mission, are going to be much more common coming up. And burnout prevention. Leaders have a dual role here. One is to take care of themselves and the other is to care for others. And burnout prevention is going to be on HR's priority list, I hope, because we need to start being preventative as opposed to reactive. So with that, let's start by AI, because I know you're going to have another session on AI coming up. But Samudra Group is a great thought leader, think tank group that brings CEOs, CIOs, um, board members together. It's a really vibrant organization. And they had the AI intelligence, uh, AI uh, summits recently. And this is interesting for learning and developing folks. Why? Because they have case, case, uh, uh, case studies already on customer service, where they saw is a big telecommunications company. I'm not going to name the name, but they did a, a, a study with AI and their customer service reps. They cut down the training from six months to two months using AI. They saved 200,000 hours. How? Three minutes per call. They have a volume of 4 million calls a year. They served 200,000 hours saved. That contributes to people learning, contributes to a much more efficient way of operating the call centers. And I think this is fantastic. But what they found is the early in career, the people with the least experience had the greatest advantage and gained the greatest benefit. I think that's important. Hold that thought, BCG. BCG is an improved performance test. They put their consultants through and said, use ChatGPT, use AI, whatever you need to use to see how you improve your performance and get better results. They all did. The senior consultants, consultants, professionals, but who benefited the most? The early career consultants. The junior consultants had the greatest improvement in their performance. So you can see two industry, very, industries, very different, but what they found is that the early career benefits the most because they have less experience and they will explore with the curiosity. So this is very important to us because it leads to, we should pay attention to the early career because less experience doesn't mean less value. It just means aperture and opportunity. That's why my insights from the whole conference was we need to provide access for people to get access to the tools, to things that they need to learn how to do a better job. Acceleration, onboarding is gonna become critical and onboarding can be critical in accelerating time to value. So when you hire, could be contractors, could be your full-time employees, because that's another thing that's happening. The workforce is now a composition of multiple talent pools and we need to embrace that. It's not going to be just full-time employees who know everything. The best prompt engineers might not be in-house. In fact, McKinsey just reported that 38% of all CEOs say that, no, all CEOs says that they 38% of their people may have the skills, but they don't believe they have the deep skills that they need to transform with AI yet. So that's a very important piece. 
Now, the superpowers of AI, this is this is interesting because we know finding information, creating content, analyzing data, and writing code and automating processes. What well, those are the five things that primarily people are gravitating towards because it's the low-hanging fruit mostly. Um and <laughs> yeah, I love the question, Lindsay, because uh I think we need to think bigger in terms of skills. Skills is beyond skills. It's the capabilities, the confluence and the convergence of skills. So let's talk about that. The new workforce, just quickly, I think I said that before and I will continue to say our five Ds of the new workforce, if you think about it, they are distributed. You can get away from that, especially now with the skills of scarcity, you need to distribute your people and find the skills where you need them. Dynamic, people are thinking in terms of three years. Corn Ferris uh, just re uh, published something saying embracing the short term. <laughs> embracing short term means embrace the new organization, embrace the new early career folks. The workforce is cross-generational and you need to understand that they are very dynamic because people are thinking about growth and career advancement in months, not in years. So they come in, they need to be very well taken care and feel that they belong where they chose to be. Second year, they need to know that you're developing them. So the career conversations developing is very important. And the third year is a fair game, is an organization's responsibility to identify the top talent for leadership pipeline, or let people choose their pathways horizontally, diagonally, however they choose to do, and sometimes they might choose another company, and that's okay. What's not okay is not to focus, really focus on your early career and the people that you bring in on the first and second year to really show that you're serious about developing them. Digital, of course, they're all digital natives coming up now from organizations, from universities and college, but the whole organization needs to be digitally fluent. Diverse, uh, I think I don't need to tell you this, but in a few years, um, they I just saw the Hispanic conference. I'm a Latino executive as well, and I was very happy to see that one in five people in the US are gonna be related to a Latino line. So there will be a lot of diversity coming up because we have immigration, we have a lot of people coming. And discernment, is my favorite one. Think about the people who have access to all this information, ChatGPT and everything else. Now they are much more discerning. They're asking organizations to show if they're aligned with their values. So they're really focused on alignment. Here, I showed this picture. Look, uh, we could do a test. Um, do you know what prompt did I use to get this picture to show up? I don't even remember myself, but it would be interesting for us to start thinking about what prompts do you give ChatGPT, Claude.ai, and other tools to get the outcomes that you desire. This one I thought was beautiful, um, but working the flow of life. I think we are very creative people. We are very focused now on the balance and now people are talking about work-life harmonization, not only balance, but it's a harmonization. So what I'm trying to say here is it's important for us to start thinking that the work has to be dynamic and has to be interactive and has to be respected as part of somebody's life. So the flexibility, adaptability that we offer our employees and start talking asynchron uh, working asynchronously, I think this is all important questions coming up for next year because people need to feel that they have the agency to decide for themselves where to put their energy, when to take a break, when to go into work, and also when to start learning and reserve that time. So work in the flow of life, not life in the flow of work. And learning to change and grow. I love this because learning to change is hard. And I wrote a book and I share with you the title. Uh, it's about the learning from inside out, learning to change how you perceive things, learning how you position yourself in organizations, they have in different ways of acting, decision-making, how people share leadership and power, 
I keep saying this, and I think it's true. Distributed teams, if they are self-directed teams, they need distributed power. So organizations that are going to win in the future are going to be distributed organizations with distributed power so people can make decisions closer to the client much faster and the agility comes from there. Now, this is interesting. I would love to hear your opinions um, because this is brand new for my books coming up. The book's called The Leading to Succeed because in my view, everyone is a leader during transforma transformative years. We are going through continuous transformations. I truly believe that early in career workers, individual contributors, every single member of the organization has to start cultivating leadership skills to be successful. Why? Because they are going to start learning self-management. They are going to start learning how to behave in a team that's cross-functional. It's not their intact teams. Their managers might not be leading the mission. So they need to be really fluid in the way they show up, in the way we interact with others, in the way we are understanding the environment. And that's why I came up with five very important capabilities and skills. That brings a cluster of skills with them. Cognitive mastery. And I, and I use CARDS, C-A-R-D-S, because honestly, it is an acronym. We can say the CARDS but also reflects the transparency of the environment of the future. We are demanding transparency. We are demanding access to data. And I think that's very healthy. So I say, play your cards right and you're gonna be successful. But most importantly, show your cards. Be always open, be authentic, but show your cards. Show how good you can be and how creative you can be in, in in this transition moment that we are going through. So cognitive mastery, very quickly. It's about learning about yourself, being conscientious, understanding your emotional development and how you're reacting to situations and people because we are mostly reactive people. But we need to learn to pause. We need to learn what's coming from our upbringing and from our own emotional difficulties instead of projecting on others, instead of like reacting abruptly. Because at the end of the day, guess what? People are going to remember the mostly the bad behaviors that you exhibit. People are not going to remember always when you're so good, you're so good, you're so good. There, there will be moments in talent reviews that they're going to say, oh, but remember that meeting when so-and-so lost their temper. Oh, remember, they are not very collaborative. So avoid the, all that. Cognitive mastery means being in charge and knowing how you emotionally react to things, your triggers, cognitively pay attention to how you can orchestrate a response instead of a reaction. That's going to be very important. Adaptive resilience. I say adaptive resilience because most people say, I'm resilient, I'm tough. But being tough and having grit is not resilience. Resilience is being able to return to a state of confidence, a state of calm and, and, and being stable to continuously deal with the complexity. So this adaptive resiliency is because one day the problem is layoffs. The next day is the industry that was disrupted by a, 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 a startup. So you need to start being adaptive in the way you show your resilience because empathy, compassion, this is very important, but don't show up brittle and rigid just to get it through because you are tough. That might lead you to a point where actually you're going to wake up and feel that you have emotions, and that's very important. Deal with emotions as they come, be adaptive, and seek support. Reciprocity alignment. I find this very important. Reciprocity, we are in the era of reciprocity. Across our ecosystems, organizations are helping each other. Organizations are levering each other. We are levering each other's teams. And the reciprocity is, is beyond the walls of the organization because you are going to be reaching out to experts on large language models to help you with AI. You're going to be reaching out to people who understand different industries to help you. So the reciprocity alignment is for all leaders and workers to start thinking how much 
do I give in my role and how much do I expect in return? What are my rewards? Rewards are not only monetary rewards. They can be pride. They can be a lot of um, uh, rewards for your actions and for your um, sharing. Sharing is a power skill. I truly believe is a power skill. Sharing is something that we should do by default. Digital fluency. I told you about uh, digital fluency, and I think that's really important because the whole workplace is digital right now, and the tools that are coming up are amazing. And the personalization of your experience depends on your fluidity with those platforms and all that. So this is coming up as a critical moment for us. Um, our employee experience, our customer experiences are mostly digital and they are done in platforms. What we need to do is to create frictionless experiences, and that's hard to do. And sense-making. Sense-making comes from your maturity. Understanding Howard Gardner, who was a writer about the intelligence that we have as human beings, he said one of the key mindsets that we need for the future is a synthesizing mind. You need to be able to synthesize the volume of data, insights, information, and all these nuggets of learning. You have to be able to synthesize the world around you with all its complexity to make sense and share with others and move forward. I think this is going to be critical. Sense-making is so important. So that's your cards. Cognitive mastery, adaptive resilience, reciprocity alignment, digital fluency, sense-making. You're going to be a great leader if you can master all of them. But leadership is everybody's business, like I said. So be prepared. I think from now on, we have to see ourselves as leaders. I know there's imposter syndrome. I know sometimes you don't feel equipped, but those are all part of growth. Imposter syndrome is nothing but a reaction to a new situation in which you are being challenged to a point of feeling that maybe you don't have the skills, maybe you don't have the experience. But trust me, new experiences will lead to growth. And that's how you need to see imposter syndrome as just part of this. And if you allow that to expand too much, it becomes a hindrance. But if you allow that to just be don't pay attention to it. It's just a thought. Leadership is everybody's business because everyone is a leader. This is important for learning and development, folks. Clarity creates capacity. Think about the times that we spend trying to be perfect because we don't know what's expected of us. Think about how much time we spend chit-chatting and gossiping and talking to people because we feel burned out and we don't know where the company is going. How many minutes, how many hours do we spend trying to figure out things because we don't know where to find the answer. So for organizations, the most important piece is be clear about your strategy, your direction, be clear about the skills they are emerging, the skills they are declining, because organizations have to provide that information to employees. Clarity on the strategy and direction, clarity on the skills they are gonna be needing capabilities, because with the clarity, I guarantee you, you're going to create capacity. So, that said, um, well, I see this question number five here. The organization is reluctant to give employees more flexibility, especially when it comes to more flexible hours and working from home. That's when you start focusing on performance as opposed to, well, productivity is a little harsh, but performance, because if you get the outcomes that you desire, um, <laughs> Pollock, the painter, he used to do his paintings in five to 10 minutes. So it's not amount, the amount of time that you spend making a painting. It's the outcome and the impact you have with that painting. So start thinking that way. Some people can work really fast using ChatGPT or some, if you are more productive using the resources that you have, you might do work much faster. And the flexibility here is up to you. You have to schedule your time to be with the kids, with the family, with, with the school, with sports. I think all this comes to a point where we have to focus on capabilities. What is the outcomes we are trying to reach? 
And are we able to achieve the same outcomes with adaptability and flexibility? So it's not dictating hours. It's about trusting employees to manage their lives well and deliver the outcomes expected. That's different. For learning, curate. Try not to just keep developing new things because there is so much available. Curating, co-creating the environment, connecting the dots because learning has to be connected to application of the, 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 the knowledge. Telemarketplaces are great. When you have uh, an incredible uh, personalization of one's gaps in their skills, aspirations for a new uh, a new a new role all this comes into play here because then you can curate personalize co-create with your clients with your people and connect the dots this learning is connected to this mission this capability that we are building so everything is interconnected try not to develop two new many new materials because they're all out there is about how do we bring this to a learning experience platform. And I truly believe in this. Every encounter is an opportunity to learn. So when you do telemarketplaces, the gig economy internally, when you send somebody to a conference, when you are running to somebody that's interesting to you and you ask a question, every encounter is an opportunity to learn and leaders must be learners. I think that's a very important concept as well because the organizations are much flatter. And one thing before we go into questions, the learning organization is a human-centered ecosystem because that's our goal, is to elevate the skills of the people delivering collective outcomes with a shared purpose and common goals. That's collective leadership. And I think you, I, I hope you, you see this as an emergence of a new way of thinking, a new way of proposing, and leveraging the skills, the capabilities that comes from everybody in the organization. So learning is almost about identifying the spots, identifying the, the communities, identifying how you can connect the dots. And I love coaching circles. Coaching circles is experiential learning with a safe environment, with psychological safety that really increases the retention of your knowledge because you're conversing, you are experimenting, and you're talking about it. This is my book. If you want to take a picture of the QR code, takes you to Amazon. Coming up uh, in January, coming out January 30th. But uh, it's all there. There's a coaching model that is the expressions of leadership and much more. But thank you so much. I would love any questions that you might have. I answer a few, but I would love to hear your questions. Brittany, any questions? Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Wagner, for such an insightful keynote. Looks we have looks like we have time to answer at least a couple other questions. Um, what sure. qualities or skill sets do you think will be most valuable in the new year? I think is this <laughs> this idea of getting out of yourselves. Sometimes we get so focused on our own needs, on, on the need to know, to be confident, the need to explore and be better. Of course, we all want to be better. But the ability to be adaptable, the ability to not be too emotionally attached to our ideas or projects, the ability to see the broader consequences and impact of our actions, so it's almost like this, this ability to, to absorb reality without reacting to reality. So it's really not being attached to what's happening because the reality is everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. You have to remember that. So adaptability to have a fluid experience is going to be the most important skill. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this next question, what are the biggest reasons employees are hesitant to obtain new skills or take part in any upskilling programs? I don't think you're going to be uh, denying this, or you might, and I would love to hear your point. But think about what's happening. People are feeling that they are delivering to the best of their abilities, considering the context we are in after the pandemic, I think it's it's almost like out of sight, out of mind, but we are still healing. The healing process is years. We have been 
through collective uh, trauma for a long time. So we need to allow ourselves to heal. I think people are really exhausted because there is too much mind work that we are doing because we have to think about all these and still reflect on how we are going to manage the reality. So to make a long story short, I think people are willing. People keep saying people are tired and fatigued. Change fatigue is a problem. The problem is not change fatigue. Somebody was saying this the other day, and I agree. The problem is the lack of action in our organizations that we are tired of because we offer feedback and it's wonderful to offer feedback. I don't think anybody's fatigued from talking about the problems and the challenges that we have, but people are getting tired of not seeing actions from senior leadership. I think that's a different story. So when you say the reasons, there are many reasons because they don't believe that getting a new skill is gonna promote their, their, their advancement. We need to have systems that really work. If you ask people to upskill, you have to give them the opportunity to use that skill and you need to reward them with some kind of movement in their career. So I don't think it's a lack of will. It's just the system is not set up to benefit the employee when they take time off, they take time to learn and they don't see the rewards coming. I think that's what it is. But prove me wrong. I would love to be proved wrong. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Wagner. That is all the time we have for sure. questions. But thank any you. questions we did not get to, we will be sure to share those with you after the event. Thank you again so much for such an incredible keynote. I also wanted to thank everyone thank who joined us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Thank you again, Wagner. Thank you.